With this video being uploaded in October, it seems like a good time to cover the spookiest monster type in Yu-Gi-Oh! Zombies. Well, I guess the fiend type could also be the creepiest. And some of the fairies. And what about the plants? And the... well, Yu-Gi-Oh! has some scary looking cards all around. But regardless, if there was any Yu-Gi-Oh! monster type that would be perfect for Halloween, it would be the zombies, or undead as it's known in Japan. As you would expect, these monsters are different types of undead creatures by design, whether they're zombies, ghosts, vampires, etc. And they usually have effects based around reviving from the graveyard and graveyard control. The effects vary from individual zombies to full zombie archetypes, but that's generally what we see. However, since it's one of my videos, I want to look at some of the weirder zombie choices from Yu-Gi-Oh's history, which are really just the zombies that make me go, hmm, before I understand them. It could be an awkward effect, an unexpected retrain, a strange origin, or simply how they look. Weird definitely is not a bad thing, it just means I had a question or two when I first saw them. Some of these cards are actually fantastic. And joining me is my co-host who may or may not be a zombie, Judgment Meter. I'm not allowed to watch scary movies. Now, let's resurrect the top 10 weirdest zombie monsters in Yu-Gi-Oh! Number 10, Vampire Genesis. It's hard to put yourself back in the mindset of 2005 when this card came out, since looking at it now, it's all barking no bite. Well, I guess it had bite, but in hindsight, this was a lackluster boss from the start. In the first TCG structure decks not based around just the anime, we got a dragon and zombie deck. With vampires just being a few cards and not a full archetype yet, the zombie deck was mostly just good zombie cards from the time, like Pyramid Turtle, Ryukoki, and Spirit Reaper, with some various staples that could go in any deck. But one new card, the headliner of the box, was Vampire Genesis. Genesis. I prefer Vampire Super Nintendo. And even at the time, he was just a gimmick. Once you looked into his effect, you were probably more inclined to use some of the other high-level monsters included in the deck. It came with Vampire Lord and Dark Dust Spirit. Those monsters could clean house at the time. Genesis has the effect that once per turn, you can discard a zombie to revive a zombie. But the zombie that you revive must have a level lower than the one that you discarded. The best scenario they tried to set up for you is you send Despair from the Dark to the Graveyard to get back any monster since it has such a high level. But you're not always going to have Despair from the Dark in your hand. Sometimes it's just going to be Master Kyoshin in your hand, and all the zombies in your graveyard are also level 4. So Genesis's effect is moot, and you basically just have a 3000 attack point vanilla monster now. It was just such a disappointing card that had this huge buildup on the box art and anime episode. What's even more of a sting with the mediocrity of this boss is you have to get rid of a good monster to summon it. You can only summon Genesis by banishing a Vampire Lord that you control. Vampire Lord got power crept eventually, but at the time, it was pretty good. Being able to revive itself if destroyed by card effects and forcing your opponent to send a card from deck to graveyard. So for giving up your monster that has some destruction revival, you get a thousand more attack points with an effect that sometimes doesn't work and no destruction revival. He looks cool. Looks like he can be in JoJo's. A lot of things in Yu-Gi-Oh look like they can be in JoJo's. <laughs> This card is mostly funny in hindsight, looking at how the vampire archetype evolved. It started off as just Lord and Lady doing their things, and it eventually evolved into an archetype themed around milling and taking control of your opponent's monsters. So swept under the rug, they have a long obsolete boss that doesn't really fit with their playstyle. You could say the mighty have fallen with Genesis, but he wasn't really that mighty to begin with, except maybe his pecs. Number 9, Zombino. Every so often, Konami may makes a normal monster that has self-contained lore and a random support card or two, like that Bruce Lee inspired mouse. Zombino is one of those normal monsters, and I always got an unsettling vibe from this one. His lore states, the two are so close, they die and return to life, inseparable. Before we get into what that refers to, the Japanese lore is written in hiragana, the most basic version of the Japanese alphabet usually used by children, implying a child is telling us the story story of this monster, or perhaps Zambino himself. There's also no punctuation. The English still retains the no punctuation element of the lore by keeping it in haiku form. Spooky. He looks so cute though. Oh, his color schemes are like Anya. She doesn't have any blue on her. Yeah, but like look at his socks. He has the gold and the black. Eh, 
Okay, I see it. I like his little sockies. The lore implies Zombino was close with another kid, both of which who have died and come back to life as zombies, which is sweet that they can still be together in some capacity, but I'm slightly freaked out by the fact that him and his friend were killed. What happened? And is that their original home in the background? Where are they? Why is Bone Mouse here? One thing that the international artwork censors is in Japanese, Zombino has an axe stuck in his skull, which has a dark implication about how he died. Or maybe it's just there for show. How long has he been dead? And why doesn't he just remove the axe already? He's kind of like a zombie doll, like a mannequin thing. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not horrified by this. Oh, you know that book with the little wormy and the apple on the bus? I don't actually. Reminds me of that worm. The other monster referenced in his lore is Zombina, who's a zombie girl who seems to be having a much better time with this whole zombie thing than Zombino is. She's just playing with her doll. Her effect lets her special summon a level 4 or lower monster from the graveyard if she's destroyed by battle, which is a type of effect that was power crept by the time she came out, but it would have been pretty solid if she came out in older formats. But the point is, a monster that could be revived with her effect is Zombino, showing how they die and return to life and their allegedly inseparable bond. It's worth noting that Zombina also seems to have died in the same way as Zombino with a blunt object to the head, making it even more tragic that they erased Zombino's axe since it removes one of the parallels between these cards. This one I don't like as much. I like the boy. What's not to like? Look at that hairstyle. She she does have a lot of hair. Oh, does she have a bun bun? Sort of. It's got a lot of legs. She has an octopus bun bun. I like her too. Too. You know, for someone who doesn't like this design, you sure got a lot of nice things to say. I'm just saying I like the boy's design a little more. I'm interested to know if there was a bigger backstory planned for these characters, or if this was just a one-off project they had. Maybe they were based on a folklore I don't know about. I feel like they're going to get some sort of story expansion at some point, since they are referenced on a few modern cards. On Monster Assortment, which supports normal and defect monsters with certain aspects in common, there are two monsters featured on the cookies, and on Evil Twins Trouble Sunny, you can see that the live twins are cosplaying as Zombino and Zombina in the background. They have to be known in some capacity in the monster universe if celebrities are copying them. Also, I never noticed how beautiful this card's background is. Number 8, Pumpkin the King of Ghosts. I spoke about Pumpkin in detail on my potential retrain list, but to summarize, I have no idea what they were trying to do with this card. In the anime, it pumped up zombies attack by 10% every turn using its roots via ectoplasmic fortification. But they can't do percentages with card effects in real life, that's a given. So instead, they had it boost all zombies attack and defense when it's summoned by 100, and then another 100 every one of your standby phases for the next four turns specifically, and then no boost after that. The increase was weak, but attempted to emulate the anime effect to an extent, just with a turn limit. While that part of the effect seemed arbitrary, there was one one more catch. This effect only worked when Castle of Dark Illusions was on the field, which was a fiend monster that had nothing to do with zombies in the anime and wasn't even used by the zombie duelist. But in real life, for some reason they made it slow zombie support that boosted zombies but only when flipped, so it was a monster that wasn't worth playing outside of having a good defense stat at the time, meaning Pumpkin was even more worthless since nobody was setting up the castle. Plus, it was a level 6, so you would have had to tribute summon it when it came out, meaning no one's gonna play this. As discussed in our potential retrain list, this card and Bones' other zombies are almost definitely going to get a retrain someday with how often cards from the original manga and anime get retrained, but that's just a hope for the future. For now, this effect is dreadful. The only thing he's got going for him is he's apparently royalty. He's a king, or he just wanted to feel important so he got himself a crown. But it's made out of real candy. Corn. Does he feel threatening to you at all? I'm not enamored and I'm not creeped out. That being said, the king's been referenced on a few other zombies over the years. For example, we learned that he has a daughter, Pum Princess. Her effect is pretty clever, where when she's destroyed, she plants her roots as a continuous spell and gets a pumpkin counter during each player's standby phase. For every counter on her, the opponent's monsters lose 100 attack and defense. While the stat loss is inconsequential, 
if you finish your opponent off quickly, this card is dominant in limited formats, where it was released early in Duel Link's life and thrived. I also like how her effect parallels Pumpkin's effect, while being a much less restrictive version of his. You still get the stat changes on the standby phase, but now it's both players' standby phases, and not just the user. And it's indefinite and uses counters to keep track of itself, so monsters summoned after the effect starts taking place are still affected, and no extra monsters are needed to activate this effect. Also, she opens up many more questions on how Pumpkin reproduces. Does he have a family? Is he a single father? Aww. She's an Octo Pumpkin. Why is everything mixed with an octopus? Finally, Pumpkin cameos on the monster Jacobolan, which is a useful card that can special summon itself, and on your opponent's turn, it can revive a zombie from the graveyard if Jack banishes itself until the end of the turn. But if you look closely at his body, he's wearing the empty corpse of Pumpkin! You killed him! He's dead! Well, more dead than he was before. Or maybe this is the spirit of Pumpkin bursting out of its physical shell to reveal his true form, but likely it's the former and Pumpkin is now just an accessory. That man had a daughter and you murdered him. I hope she's planning a revenge plot against you that takes place on another card. Number seven, three-legged zombies. Three-legged zombie, one, two, uh, well, you know what? As long as he can move about and get places. This card is weird for how much unexpected love they gave it over the years. Their lore states that they're two zombies of differing sizes that are friendly but have trouble traveling. They're probably based on a three-legged race, and they seem like chill guys. Apparently, being friendly paid off since they got a bit of the red carpet treatment. They were somewhat rare when released internationally, being common cards in the McDonald's Kids Meals promotion in 2002, which had a bunch of throwaway cards that were not yet introduced in the TCG that either weren't good or were rare and looked better than they actually were. It then took 10 years for the zombies to get a more accessible release, where in 2012, it was in the reprint set Legendary Collection 3, where three-legged zombies got a re-release as a super rare? Why did they give it a shiny card? In Japan, it was just a basic secret rare? What did they do to get such notoriety? Though, it wasn't in a standard booster pack for its Japanese Japanese release. It was a mail-in promotion with Shonen Jump for free cards, and this was one of them, so why not make the promo cards fancy looking? But still, why did this monster get such nice treatment? It's not like it was super powerful, it's just a normal 1100 attack point monster with no connection to the anime. I guess it's powerful in Hitatsumi Giant format, but I feel like someone at Konami just must have really liked this guy. Even more surprising was this random normal monster from 1999 got a retry in 2015, and it wasn't just a fun little reference to the past, they made it one of the best zombie monsters in the game. Unizombie has two effects, and it's a tuner making it handy for synchro decks. Its first effect lets you target a monster, including itself, and increase its level by one if you discard a card, which is useful for specific synchro summons, and the discard is good for getting cards in your graveyard. But more importantly, the second effect lets you do the same level increase effect, but for the cost of sending one zombie monster from your deck to your graveyard. Any effect that lets you choose a monster to send from deck to graveyard is top tier. As mentioned, many zombies have graveyard or resurrection effects, so you can send a plethora of zombies to the graveyard to keep your strategy rolling, like Necro World Banshee to search your zombie world, Glow Up Bloom to search your big zombies, or Doom King Balderdrock for a free big summon. The Unizombie effect locks you out of attacking with monsters that aren't zombies, but you're likely playing this in a zombie deck, so that's a non-factor. The level modulation is a nice effect if you need it, but these effects are really just not-so-secret ways to get free things in the graveyard. Not only did they get an effect upgrade, but the artwork also got polished. They went from being a couple of frail zombies to a couple of bros having a good time. They're doing drunk karaoke now. They're in full, give us a song, the piano man. Oh, I love that. Oh, they're just regular dudes. They're regular salary man dudes. Dudes, love it. I also appreciate what these guys did for the landscape of zombie monsters. They appear on the quick play spell Unisong Tuning, where we see the other major zombie tuner, Plague Spreader Zombie, has joined in on the singing, and they're being conducted by Zombie Master. So they took a couple of formerly creepy guys and formed a band together. Love that for them. Number six, Pain Painter and Mad Mauler. These cards are related to Plague Spreader Zombie, one of the best tuner monsters historically 
Strictly speaking, it may have gotten power crept past its useful stage now, but back in the day, it was a free level 2 tuner if you return a card from your hand to the top of the deck, so people used it a lot to get out quick level 5 or 6 synchros. He technically was meant for being used in zombie synchro decks for summoning corrupted versions of famous monsters who are now level 6 zombie synchros and Doom Kaiser Dragon, but a lot of people just used him for the special summon. I do find it funny that the backstory appears to be that he infected Ha Des and Summon Skull since they're now zombies, and his name implies that he's carrying some sort of zombie virus. But as far as effect and lore go, he is your standard good card. The only weird thing about him is his design. It's supposed to be ambiguous, I think, but like, what, what is this? He's got a skull face, but bare arms, a horse leg, dragon's tail, and I think he has a glow stick lodged in his skull. I like his color scheme. It kind of looks like he's wearing neon jammies. However, the weirdest thing about Plague Spreader Zombie to me is he has two forms that no one seemed to have cared about, Pain Painter and Mad Mauler. Does anyone remember these guys existed? Their names count as Plague Spreader Zombie, implying they represent the same or similar zombie viruses, and their effects specifically support getting at the synchro monsters that need Plague Spreader as a tuner, which they count as. Pain Painter is a level 2 tuner that lets you target two monsters and turn them into level 2 zombies for the turn, which just so happens to total to level 6 if you count Painter in there for your level 6 synchros that need zombie monsters, including Archfiend Zombie Skull which needs two zombie non-tuners. And Mad Mauler is a level 2 tuner that can summon itself from the graveyard by targeting a level 6 or higher monster that you control and reducing its level by 2. So if you happen to do that to a level 6 zombie, you now have the perfect level total for two of the Plague Spreader synchros. And it locks you into only summoning zombies if you use Mad Mauler's effect, so it incentivizes you to go for the specific synchros. These cards don't seem that bad, and Mad Mauler actually seems like it could be useful, but it's funny how little they matter in the Plague Spreader legacy. I wonder if Plague Spreader's support implies we were going to see a bigger lineup of monsters that they just never expanded on, like more undead famous monsters as synchros or other Plague Spreader tuners. Also makes me question the backstory about these tuners. Are these two guys other types of Plague Spreader zombies? Are they the original zombie with jobs? Or are they maybe normal humans infected by the Plague Spreader zombie? Which is kind of sad if you think about it. Did this painter have a family? Does that make him more likable now? Painting is supposed to be relaxing. Yeah, I mean, he's technically resting in peace. Not that relaxed. I like that even in death, he still has all of his paint supplies ready. You know know he's ready because he's wearing overalls. Maybe dead, but he has standards. How about the clown? What do you think about him? <laughs> I don't like this one. I like nice clowns. I only like honks. What's he wearing? Those are the faces of the damned. Oh no, there's also one on his face. I don't like that. Actually, Mad Mauler had some weird censorship going on. His Japanese name was Mad Murder, so they toned down what he was so mad about in his name, and they illuminated his throwing knives, which was something Konami occasionally had hang-ups about with other bladed cards, like how Edgem sabers were scissors that they did not want to show as is, so they made them laser scissors. But for Mad Mauler, they barely added light to the knives, so it's almost not noticeable. Oh, they're glow sticks now. Sleep all day, party all night, sleep all day, party all night, sleep all day, party all night. Number 5, Ghost Mourner and Moonlit Chill and Ghost Sister and Spooky Dogwood. The Yokai Girl girls are modern icons of Yu-Gi-Oh! Well, maybe half of them, and one of them isn't even a zombie. But to talk about the lesser ones, I need to talk about the good ones. They are a series of hand traps based on mischievous spirits of the afterlife with something after an ampersand. They're all quick effects that let you discard them, usually in reaction to something your opponent tries to do. The best one is Ash Blossom and Joyous Spring, which stops one of three vital parts of the modern game. It can either negate an effect that adds a card from deck to hand, stops a special summon from the deck specifically, or stops a foolish burial effect that sends a card from deck to graveyard. I consider her one of the mascot monsters of Yu-Gi-Oh that's not from the anime. Her sticking out her tongue on her artwork and laughing at you when she resolves in Master Duel defines how this card is trolling you whenever you see it. So cute. She has a big forehead. But look, she's so cute. The next best may be Ghost Ogre and Snow Rabbit, which destroys a card on the field if it activates an effect, making for good disruption. She's the odd one out in the sense that she's actually a psychic monster, and she can be sent 
from field to graveyard in addition to being discarded, while the rest of the ghosts must be discarded to activate, but she follows their theme otherwise, so she's an honorary member of the group. <gasps> bun Bun! Bun Bun! What is she doing? The rabbit is helping the girl exercise ghosts. <gasps> She has a job! The other girl tied for second place is Ghost Bell in Haunted Mansion, which stops any effect that removes a card from the graveyard, whether it be from summon, banish, or adding a card from graveyard to hand. After those three, though, you get the ghost girls who are either bad or very niche backups. The best of the bottom three, in my opinion, is Ghost Reaper and Winter Cherries, who let you reveal a card in your extra deck, and then banish any cards in your opponent's extra deck with that name. It's good for decks that don't use their own extra deck, so you can fill up your extra deck with staples like the Nightmares or whatever monsters are meta relevant, but it's mainly useful if you know your opponent's deck. If you're going in blind against a rogue deck or your opponent's doing a good job of hiding what they're playing, it may whiff and be a dead card in your hand, no pun intended. Also, I like her scythe. I feel the most threatened by this one. She's the Kana. They should hang out together. I hope so. And finally, we have the two that introduced this segment. Ghost Sister and Spooky Dogwood let you discard her to gain life points equal to every monster's attack point value that your opponent special summons for that turn. It's basically max C for life point gain, but life point gain is generally a poor strategy to focus around since if your opponent stops your other effects from going off, they can still attack you. It just takes more turns to take you down. But still, your life points can get to comedically high levels with this card. This one is also funny since they censored it in English by referring to her as sister to less directly call her a nun to avoid religious connotations, and they removed part of her headpiece for that same reason. Oh my goodness. Why, why is that dog a different art style? It's spooky. It's like a child animation puppet. Well, that's good, right? It's living up to the name Spooky Dogwood. Yeah. It wouldn't be spooky if it wasn't next to the anime girl, but it's like bear in the big blue house or something. What's up with that dog? Why did they make it like that? That was definitely a choice. And now we get to who I think is the worst of them, Ghost Mourner and Moonlit Chill, who's a simple effect negation when your opponent special summons a monster, with the potential of burn damage if that monster leaves the field. It sounds nice, but it seems like it's just a worse version of Effect Valor, which can only be used during the main phase, but it can be used at any time during that phase, not just when a monster is summoned. And it's not even once per turn like the Ghost Girls are. But Mourner does have the advantage in the design department since she's tugging the bunny ears on her hood, which is adorable. <sighs> she's so cute! In the end, I'd probably say each of the bottom three are weird because Ghost Mourner for the worst effect, Reaper for the most risky, and Sister for the most uncanny. Number 4, Great Mammoth of Goldfine. This card appeared on my original Weird Fusion Monsters list, but in the years that have passed since we covered it, I realized what made it even weirder than the other nonsensical fusions at the time. Old fusion monsters never followed a theme in the original batch. They were just random monster designs that arbitrarily had specific monsters as materials to summon them with polymerization as your only option, so they were basically unviable. Great Mammoth of Goldfine, who is a zombie mammoth, uses the Snake Hair, who is Medusa, and Dragon Zombie, who is a dragon zombie, so as you can see, none of these make sense on why they turn into elephant bones. The fact that early fusion monsters were not designed to be fusion monsters was evident with some normal monsters in the manga and anime, like Barox, Bakuri Box, and Flame Swordsman, being fusion monsters in real life for no reason. Sometimes the random materials made sense, like Flame Swordsman being a swordsman and a fire guy, or Burning Zombie being a skeleton and molten rock, but others were just monsters they had lying around, like Fusionist, who's a cat, being a sheep and angel ball. However, when fusions showed up in the manga, they made sense since they were planned to be fusions from the start, like Gaia the Dragon Champion, Black Skull Dragon, or Humanoid Worm Drake. But when the anime made up filler duels that were not in the manga, they decided to add a few fusions based on how they were in the real life card game, meaning we saw the unusual combinations take place. And here's what made it weirder for me than the other fusions at the time. Great Mammoth of Goldfine was in one of the first duels with an early fusion that wasn't in the manga, so seeing this mammoth come out of Medusa
Medusa and a dragon was jarring when I first saw it as a kid. And I know it's Yu-Gi-Oh where crazy things happen on the daily, but before this, every time a fusion happened in the anime, it made sense. Go down my list from earlier in the segment. I can add more if you'd like. Rabbit Horseman, Thousand Eyes Restrict, Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon. I think the only other anime duel at this point that summoned a fusion monster that wasn't in the manga was Johnny Steps summoning Musician King. So for whatever reason, Great Mammoth was the fusion monster that finally made me say, wait, why do most fusions not make sense from the early days? I think it's also that this mammoth looked a bit too on the nose like another monster. Didn't Yugi use this? Yes to Mammoth Graveyard, no to the mammoth that we're talking about for this entry. Are they related? Sort of, but Konami wants us to pretend that they're completely different. Look at their types. One's a dinosaur, one's a zombie. Goldfine is a bit more than just a palette swap of Mammoth Graveyard. We discussed it in the fusion video, but this card is literally just Mammoth Graveyard from a shot in the manga when it's battling Killer Needle against Weevil, so it truly is Mammoth Graveyard visually. It's also weird how this card was around in 1999 in Japan, but they waited until 2013 to print it in English for a reprint set, alongside one of its materials, the snake hair. It made its appearance feel more mysterious in the anime in the US. And while we're at it, the final bit of weird trivia, also discussed in the fusion video is the Goldfine in its English name is a reference to Lloyd Goldfine, co-producer at 4Kids, which honestly, I'm fine with. The Japanese name is just Golden Demon Elephant, so the title makes it feel more exotic, and it's not like he's taking the name of a major card, it's just a useless card that sits in your collection. Kind of like how another producer, Michelle Dunn, got her name on Rose Spectre of Dunn. And then there's the producer with the last name Slifer, who got the Egyptian guide card for Osiris, but we're past the point of no return for that. Anyway, Great Mam the Goldfine, you're weird like the rest of the fusions of your time, but at least you're a level 6 so I can use you with ready fusion. Number 3, King of the Skull Servants. If you play the Skull Servant archetype, then you're cool, no one can hate you. But it's interesting looking at its history of how it went from being a worthless normal monster to a guy with respectable support. This was just a throwaway card with horrid stats that appeared in the first TCG set and the starter box in Japan, which had a bunch of low stat normal monsters. But something about Skull Servant stuck. People regarded him as one of the worst cards in the game, and while no one was itching to summon him normally, I think that title was exaggerated. But regardless, the title of being the worst got it attention. So in the set The Lost Millennium, he got his first drip of support, King of the Skull Servants. His effect gives him 1000 attack per original Skull Servant and King in the Graveyard, along with a revival effect if he banishes one of them from the graveyard if he's destroyed by a battle. As cool as he sounds, there were only two monsters in the game at the time that gave him a boost, and with three each allowed per deck, you would only be able to get one of them to 5,000 attack at most with no reliable ways to get the rest of them in the graveyard yet. So at the end of the day, he was still a joke card, but with potential. Here's a few notable things about King of the Skull Servants upon his release. It feels like he was the first legacy support card for a random specific normal monster not prominent in the anime. Other normal monsters did get legacy support, like Dark Magician, Blue Eyes, Red Eyes, and Harpy Lady, but as mentioned, they were prominent in the anime, so they get a pass. Another thing about the King is this was the last card to have Skull Servant in its name. In Japanese, the original Skull Servant was just named White, W-I-G-H-T, which is a term used for some sort of ghost or supernatural being, and the King was named named White King in Japanese, so future support included White in all the monsters' names in English, making Skull Servant's support in the future consistent with the Japanese names. The archetype is technically called White, but you can't shake off the legacy of the Skull Servant name. And now the support keeps on coming. Next up was Lady in White, who protects low-level zombies from battle and card effects. White Prince, who dumps more Skull Servants into the graveyard. White Princess, who sends the Prince to the graveyard and can can send herself to the graveyard to lower all monsters' stats on the field. White Mare, who discards himself to either return banished Skull Servants to the graveyard, or resummons your banished kings or ladies. And White Baking, who's a hand trap that protects your Skull Servants and can search them. And not only do you get to add two Skull Servant related cards when White Baking goes to the graveyard, but it has you discard a card after adding, meaning you can then trigger more of your graveyard effects for your Skull Servant monsters, or just beef up the and notice how all these new support monsters have effects
effects that send themselves to the graveyard? Well, they have bonus effects that say their name counts as Skull Servant in the graveyard, which means a certain king who I said might be a joke is now getting more of a boost. A real boost. Like the attack stat is five digits long now and you're dying in one hit. I love seeing the progression of how they made this skeleton viable, and the support shows how he built up a family with a wife, kids, and dog, which I covered on a backstory list showing how they have many wacky adventures on other spells and traps. Oh my goodness, he's so squat. I like how he has a little dog. What do you think about Lady in White? She seems like she's up your alley. <gasps> oh my god, it's like Catherine the Great, but skeleton. This one I like. And how about the fancy white mare? Oh my god, I love him. Do you think that's his friend or his waiter? Or just like part of the scenery? I don't know. He's just kind of there. Maybe a butler. Oh, I love it. I don't know if white baking is one of the nameless other skull servants or is just the king at a grill out, but it's hilarious how it's a parody of the king's pose. The effect is great, but the artwork had me hooked immediately. What? Why? What's he gonna do with it? He's happily roasting yams over a fire. He's going to eat them. I think it's pretty self-explanatory. But he's a, he's a zombie. A hungry zombie. I'm so glad. Okay, so you agree he's the best looking one. Hold on there. This is, just, it's, I don't know. Why? I feel like the other ones were like zombies in zombie land, but this is like a zombie in human land. He's allowed to be in human land if he wants to. We love him here. Number two. Fushio Richie. So much is weird about this card, from the name, to the way it's summoned, to it being an ultra rare. We discussed its name origin in my Yu-Gi-Oh! name translation list, but as a refresher, his Japanese name is Nosferatu Lich, so Vampire Lich, and when it was being localized, its name was going to be Undead Lich in English, but they instead translated that into Japanese for its English name, with Undead being Fushio in Japanese, and Lich being pronounced Richie using Japanese characters. I don't know if this was a mistake or if it's one of those scenarios where they thought the Japanese word sounded cooler and made that the English name, but I like that this name makes it sound like the skeleton man is named Richie and Fushio is some sort of adjective or job title. But once you get past the weird name, have you ever noticed how you have to summon this guy? It says you can only special summon him by tributing the monster Great Dizard after that card has fulfilled the condition, which is a very awkward word Wording, but this card hasn't gotten a reprint since the mid-2000s, so please forgive it. Now let's go over to Great Dizard to see what he has to do to bring out Richie. This monster is a level 6 spellcaster that gains effects depending on the number of monsters it destroys. One monster and he negates spells and traps that target him specifically. Two monsters and he can tribute himself to summon Fushio Richie from the hand or deck. I guess the first effect is fine and the second one is for a stronger card that you must have in the deck, but I think think this is actually a one-of-a-kind effect. I've never seen a card that has one and two written out in letters like this, and this is the only one I know where it's a different effect if you destroy a second monster. There are effects that activate when you destroy monsters with other monsters, but usually it's the same effect stacking, like Shura the Blue Flame or Malevolent Sin. But the uniqueness doesn't help the fact that he's a level 6 with attack equal to Gemini Elf, which means there's really no reason to summon him over other level 6s at the time of his release. But let's say you really want to summon Richie, you get him out. Now what? Well, you have the spell and trap targeting protection, so you don't lose that by getting rid of Dizard, but Richie's main effect lets you special summon a zombie from your graveyard whenever he's flipped face up, and he has an effect that flips him face down so you can continue doing this. As you would guess, it's a lot of work for a revival that's essentially once per turn that still requires you to flip it face down, but at least its stats are nice so you could survive being flipped face down for a turn. Turn, the 2900 defense makes it hard for your opponent to hit over you, but now that you're face down, you're not immune to targeting, so the effects almost work against each other. It's obviously not worth the trouble to get this card out, but I kinda see what they were doing with the theme. A Lich is generally a necromancer who's a zombie themselves, so that's why he can constantly revive other zombies from the graveyard, and the implication is Dizard kills monsters to achieve this dark power, thereby making himself the undead Lich. 
Strange. Clever thought process, but you're really only trying to summon this guy because he looks cool. It also hurts that both these cards were ultra rare in their premiere set, so it was expensive to get them at the time, and Richie was still an ultra rare in the reprint set, but they're cheap now if you ever want to revive your Fushio dreams today. For number one, we went with an archetype that's primarily zombies with a weird playstyle all around, a playstyle that was so bad, they had to reinvent how the archetype works and find ways to bypass the limitations forced upon them. Number one, the zombies of the ghost trick archetype. The ghost tricks are a bunch of chibi cute horror creatures that inhabit a big mansion in a little town where they cause all sorts of fun goofy shenanigans. The lighthearted nature of their personalities is expressed well on their individual monster cards, and the excitement on their spells and traps is bursting from the card art, where they're all having a good time. While their archetype is a mix of zombies, spellcasters, fairies, and fiends, I tend to associate zombies with them the most since a majority of their most iconic monsters are zombie type, and their theme overall very much embodies Halloween, right down to how their initial playstyle was meant to work. None of the main deck ghost trick monsters can be normal summoned unless there's another ghost trick monster face up on the field, meaning to start your engine, you have to set your first ghost trick monster and flip it the next turn so then you can choose what other ghost tricks to summon without having to set first. However, some of the ghost trick zombies and support have effects when they're flipped face up or when they're face down, and they can flip themselves face down again to reuse their effects, so going face down is all a part of the plan. The idea of them setting themselves is because they're playing a little game of peekaboo, where they jump out to scare the opponent, as seen on Ghost Trick Scare. Ghost Tricks are pretty organized involving their stats, where the level 1s are fiend monsters who act as hand traps to protect or support your set monsters, level 2 are spellcasters who search or stall, and level 3 are the meat of the deck, where they're the zombies who get flipped to have all sorts of effects that keep you going. And then all the level 4s are fairies, but the zombies are the list topic, so now let's rapid fire all the main deck ghost trick zombies. These zombies do the following. Ghoul, he beefs up your ghost trick's attack by combining it with their defense so they can finish out games. He also has boy band hair. Jiang Shi, the searcher of the deck, who adds a ghost trick with a level lower than the number of ghost tricks you control. There's a Shenko! Mummy, ooh, look at this big guy. He gives you an extra normal summon. I like how he's leaning. Leaning over, it looks like he's trying to fit inside of the rectangle. Skeleton, why didn't they just call him Reaper? He mills cards from the top of your opponent's deck by banishing them face down, equal to the number of ghost tricks you control. Stein, he searches archetype spells and traps, but only on battle damage. Warwolf, why did they translate it that way? He's clearly a werewolf, and the Japanese name says werewolf. It's not like it's copyrighted. Anyway, he does mild burn damage. Wait, what? The, oh, isn't there a werewolf? Talbane. And Yeti, who's just a swell guy. Also mild destruction prevention. <laughs> no, this is... I love him. To protect your face down guys, you can use your non-zombie hand traps like Ghost Trick Jack Frost to flip attacking monsters, or your field spells like Ghost Trick Mansion, Museum, or Parade to prevent your opponent from attacking your face down monsters and attack you directly instead with a bonus effect. And then you can combine that with Ghost Trick Mary, who's a hand trap that lets you special summon a ghost trick when you're attacked, and she's the ghost trick I feel has the most horrifying artwork, not so much because she She's scary, but her situation just looks terrifying. Oh my god, that looks like Euphemia. That's really sad. You can then use their traps like Ghost Trick Scare or Ghost Trick Go Round to flip your monsters face up to get their effects on your opponent's turn. The deck also has Xyz monsters for each type of monster, with the zombie guy being Ghost Trick Alucard, who prevents your opponent from targeting your Ghost Tricks and set monsters, along with being able to destroy your opponent's set cards, which might be set due to your Ghost Trick effect. Though, my favorite extra deck addition to the archetype is the Link Monster Ghost Trick Festival, which lets you use a set Ghost Trick monster as material, breaking the normal rules of having to use face-up monsters for Link summoning. I also like the spell Ghost Trick Shot, since it basically says, summon a Ghost Trick, flip another Ghost Trick to get the effect, and hey, while you're at it, attach something as Xyz material. You deserve it. I also like this card art. They're playing hockey in the house when they shouldn't. Really, the 
visual appeal of Ghost Trick is how vibrant and fun all these events look on their cards. You know you're gonna have a good time with this crew. I like to see them do regular things. Like taxes? Not that regular. They may be a slow archetype, but they know how to put on a party, and those parties are the best way to get number one on this list. Now, what did you think? Did all these zombies scare, shock, or spook you, either from fright or whatever oddity we discussed in their history? And what are some of your favorite Yu-Gi-Oh! zombies, both on and off the list? Let us know in the comments. Anyway, thank you all for watching, and we will see you in the next video.